Hey everyone, I want to welcome you guys back to episode 8 of Fernando's Improv Blog Podcast. Uh, this has uh, been a great project. I've been able to reconnect with a lot of wonderful people from my improv life. One of the amazing people I want to introduce everyone to right now is uh, Shirley Rivera. Shirley, hi. say hi. Hi everybody. Hi Fernando. Thank you so much for this opportunity. This is so wonderful that you're doing this for the improv community. No, of course. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. Uh, uh, I've known Shirley for a long time now, actually, for a few years. Uh, we we were part of the same improv scene up in San Francisco, which you're still a part of, right? I am. It's a little dormant, and I'm part of what I would call kind of the diaspora of the improv scene. Because we were, yeah, we were in San Francisco, and I actually live on the East Bay side in a town called Union City, sort of right between what would be considered South Bay and, and the East Bay, if you will. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So you would, would, were you living there in the heyday of San Francisco improv? No. Oh, yes. I guess you'd say, was I living there uh, when we met or? Yeah, or, like you remember yeah. when we met and you were doing a lot yeah. of your work. Yeah, so in there. other words, I was uh, commuting. So yeah, I actually took my first improv class in Fremont, which is on the East Bay side in 2011. And then ultimately in 2012 is when I was in San Francisco proper. I still lived in Union City, but I was basically taking um, classes uh, over at End Games. Well, and, and I want to say, I think, did you, had you already left by then? No, I was at End Games from 2011 to 2013. Yes, because you were doing that thing. I was at Engage for like two and a half years and then like a summer. Yes. And uh, yes, I I think you came up in the class behind mine. Yeah. And I would see you at jams and stuff. But, you know, slowly got to know everyone. You know, it was right. a very uh, it was a very unique community now that I've been part of other communities. And I'm not saying that in a bad way or a good way, just unique in like the demographics of who are doing improv. Um, I think there was two Latino improvisers, me and another guy named... Uh, Guillermo Martinez is a very successful animator now very nice guy yes uh, and I can't there was some people of color but like not not a lot or maybe there was a few I can't I don't know I can't remember I, I want to say that's something interesting that you bring up so in Fremont when I was there is a theater called made up theater um, it was a mix of people and I'm just thinking about my first show and one of the things that was interesting is and it was also the first class that they were teaching is that there were people over um, over 40. And at the time, like myself, I was, I think I was like 47 or 48. And um, and and in their 30s, and there were people who were younger. So when I went to San Francisco and at End Games, Guillermo was actually one of was my one of my first instructors. Oh, you're and, so lucky. Yeah, and we actually had a I believe we had a fairly mixed group. I still have a photo from our first show. Uh, you know, our grad show. And um, I, I'd say I recall it being kind of, you know, pretty mixed. But then sort of as it progressed, I was like, oh, it's a little different. And there weren't, uh, there was a few um, Asian women, actually, there, there were a couple in my first group. But yeah, that that was something that I did notice. And I was actually doing parallel Fremont and End Games. So it was, really quite different, you know, the demographics and the style of, of what was being taught. And by that, I mean, I worked in San Francisco also. And so I ended up staying late after work and I do this seven to 10 class, socialize, get in my car responsibly after socializing uh, and, and drive back over 40 minutes. And I mean, I didn't even give it a second thought. I, I just remember really enjoying improv. And it was definitely, I'd say the community interaction was different. I mean, it's a younger crowd, I would say, in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if, I'm, yeah, I'm sure people knew I was older, so. I, I never processed it. Like, I knew you were older, but it wasn't like a... A thing like I shouldn't hang out with her or anything like that. Yeah. I've always been one that if, if you get good vibe from someone, you get good vibes, and you yeah. know the, the age doesn't matter or whatever doesn't matter. 
You're not well, going to click with everyone, but the people you do click with, you know, you, yeah, it's just, it's just going to happen. It exactly. I and I don't know if we'll get into this, but I will say I remember a couple years later, there's friends of mine on a team I was on. I was on an all um, woman team, Guam Improv. And I remember one of my team members uh, getting cranky because she would notice that when we were at jams, that often I would just be gifted a character who was a mom, a grandma, like no matter what, no matter how I went on stage. And so she's like, let's do this thing. And, you know, I would try to go on, you know, arched back with a high voice or whatever. It didn't matter. You know, well, and I I'm just, so sorry to hear that. That's terrible. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'd been desensitized and I don't want to say it's, it was rampant, but it's something that I hadn't noticed and that she was kind of um, aware and, you know, kind of a little bit more heightened. And she was, she was, I'd say she's fairly young. You know, she was in her. Was she uh, also uh, Asian American? No, uh, no, but South, South Asian. South oh, Asian. okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you, you know, uh, at least, of my, I guess my generation, maybe we're more sensitive to those kinds of things because we don't want to be stereotyped. Yeah. You know, something like that. So maybe that person herself is, has a, like a radar for those things where she's exactly. like, Oh, I see this. And she's your friend. She was trying to protect you. And no, it, you weren't aware of it, you know? No, it makes sense. And, and, and I would say, you know, I, I think because of that experience I became, or that, that, you know, friend, right? That caringness. I also became um, a lot more aware about it, um, you know, kind of through my progression in improv. And I'd say part of it is, was, you know, just the physical, right? We can tell, but also just not necessarily seeing the types of narratives um, that, you know, I grew up with, um, second generation Filipino American, but also have a lot of um, aunties and uncles. Um, and, you know, I remember thinking to myself, how come I don't bring this to the stage as much? It's like, okay, I don't need to ask that question. I just need to answer it and try it and do it. But, you know, it's not the first go-to. Um, but backing um, up a little bit, I know this is about you wanting to talk to me. What I do remember when I first saw you do, was it Kablamo? Oh yes, Kablamo of Dwayne. Yes, Dwayne. Dwayne was a big fan of mine. <laughs> he just loved me. So he asked me to do Kablamo with him. <laughs> so maybe it's helpful for you to describe what Kablamo means if folks on your um, show watching are not sure. familiar with this. <laughs> um, sure, Kablamo is just, it's a two-man improv team uh, I currently hold ownership of it with my friend Frankie. Dwayne gave us uh, the blessing to have it. Um, it's just basically two guys try to do as many scenes as possible within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. That means most scenes end up being 15, 30, 45, sometimes five seconds, sometimes yeah. one second. And the idea is to never have a long scene. The idea is to just kind of like constantly reset, 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 and like edit, 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 edit. And it's very taxing physically and energy wise. And you just kind of got to like go out there and, and just trust your instincts. And yeah. It, it's not so, for the faint of heart. I, I'll say that. Well, it definitely, I would say it was very energetic. And I will say, I remember when I watched the two of you do this, when I saw it the first time, I'm like, what is going on? And particularly because it looked like, like when you're in a wrestling ring, because you guys were just bouncing off of each other. And that's what I remember how sometimes some of the scenes would end. There might be a physical kablamo or just somebody yelling it from one side. And it almost looked like this really um, kind of choreographed, you know, wrestling stage kind of performance. It was super fun. Super oh, thank, fun. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was just a... Uh... It was a format for me, uh, for me and Dwayne, and uh, Dwayne is kind of how I met you, right? You and yes. Dwayne were on a team. Yes. Well, we were on a, we were on in a show where he was part of a team, um, and I was part of a team. And then, for some reason, we also ended up being performing together. And I want to say there was one time where I know this is for a fact. There was one time where. Oh, I ended up going down to LA with three other folks, Dwayne being one of them. 
Um, I saw that show. I was there. You guys did. Oh, a reverse, that's right. We, go ahead. <laughs> you guys did a reverse Herald. You were at, I think it's, it's no longer around. It's called now improv theater. It was on Santa Monica, right? Right, right where Santa, Mo, Santa Monica uh, uh, dead ends into like Silver Lake and yeah, way end. over there. Yeah, yeah, that was that's right. We did the reverse Harold. It was you, I, Sean, Gary, Dwayne, and who was your fourth? Uh, me, Sean. Oh, uh, oh, Spencer. Spencer. Oh yeah, Spencer. Yeah, yeah. that was a, yeah. That, that was that was a good team. Yeah, that was like your first time doing that. That was that, that was, was a lot of fun. I remember that. That was a lot of fun. It was super different. And then for anybody who knows that I was in a car with them driving down from the Bay Area, the three of them, and in an Airbnb for, I think it was the equivalent of two nights, I should get a badge. You're welcome, Sean Geary. <laughs> was it really, and Spencer. No, it was was super, it really masculine or what? <laughs> no, it was just super fun. And, you know, it's just one of those things where I don't know, you just realize your friends and your improvisers, if, if that makes sense. You know, we, we did some touristy things. Um, it was great. That but, was a really good show. It was like a three hour show and there was a bunch of improv acts. Oh yeah. There was yeah. a jam. I, I was part of it. I went, you know, was, I, I remember that night very vividly. It was oh, very that's, fun. Yeah. And there was this, I can't remember the name of the format. It, hopefully it'll come to me. It has three letters. Oh, I can't remember. We, you know what, let me, let me put a pin in that and maybe it'll come to me. Um, well, you know, I just remember it was a fun night. It was a fun night. It was good seeing you guys. Uh, so that's a good, that's a good segue though. Like you got really sucked into that improv scene for a while, huh? Uh, very much so. So much so that, so what happened was when I was in um, made up theater and then partly at end games, you know, you, you go through the levels and then you're, when you finish your Herald team and then the way it was structured back then, as long as you were also um, staying together as a team and you were being coached, you could get, you know, booked stage time um, at, at end games. And it wasn't always the same at other places in the Bay Area. You know, there's sort of the main stage where maybe the folks were the ones that owned it. So there's a lot of indie teams and I was part of, hanging out with folks from the South Bay, like the San Jose um, kind of Sunnyvale Mountain View folks. We ended up starting a Facebook group, um, improv scene in the San Francisco Bay area. And it was intended to be a group so that people who were independent could go ahead and post about their shows or maybe folks that you know could meet each other that way. And part of it was even, you know, a lot of the theaters have their own Facebook pages, but you, you kind of, as an independent team, you, you know, either you're gonna come up with your own, but now where do you, how can you go ahead and, you know, um, advertise about your show? And so that's one of the reasons why we created that. Kind of a second reason was it allowed us to learn what was going on in the improv scene. So if we could get people from all over the place, we wouldn't have to like, try to scour like where is it and I think at one point also separately Dwayne had actually put together an improv calendar with that intent so with that said you know I got kind of embedded through that I mean well I, that I, group has blown up right it's got like a huge membership it's now, like right? yeah it's over 2000 I you're reminding me I that's a big am, that's a big Facebook group it is I uh, know that I announced this a couple, maybe two months ago, set in my COVID, you know, head that I would update the guidelines because the guidelines are like circa 2014. So I actually am going to put that in my bullet journal. Uh, you heard it. From gonna... <laughs> guidelines to the San Francisco improv group will be updated soon. <laughs> yeah, I, I, because I had started it. I've been kind of taking things. I mean, what's interesting about that group, and this is maybe not too much off topic, but because of uh, shelter in place, you know, what's happened with improv, as you've seen, right, are these opportunities for folks in the Bay Area or people outside of the Bay Area to take classes with folks teaching them in the Bay Area or vice versa. And so I know that at some point there was a comment about, hey, this is for improv in the Bay Area, you know, there was an observation that folks from outside of the Bay Area was also posting. And part of that is, you know, deciding who to let into the group. And I'm not the only person who can say you're in the group or not. 
Um, so I think part of it is blown up that way. I think it's also, you know, as being part of the cult, like Camp Improv Utopia, which I, you know. I know where it is, um, yes. Yeah, I, that. I haven't done it. I have to do it eventually though. You've never done it? No, I've never. I've always been broke. I've, I've lived oh. a pauper's life for most of my, I don't want to admit how many years, not, not anymore, but I've been a pauper for a long time. <laughs> I, I will say I, I went in 2013 and 2014. And I mean, really since that it's become like, you know, those tickets where it's like, it's going to open up at this hour. Boom. You got to kind of keep pressing that button to not get sold out. I don't know what it is like now. Um, but it's amazing, right? Kind of what it's sort of become because that was when it was just in on the West side. Nonetheless, I would say, you know, part of what's happened in that group is seeing folks that are that have gone to camp. Also just the different um, owners and, and um, creators of organizations and, and theaters. You know, part of it is theaters, but then there's also some, you know, indie teams or other communities that are part of it. So it's nice. I do get the benefit as an admin <laughs> to read. You know, there's questions that are an option for people to answer. So it's kind of interesting to see why people choose to, to join. Sometimes it's to mingle or, you know, just to promote their show or um, just learn more. Yeah. Well, that's great. They created that group, you know, because. Uh... Yeah, my other two, my other two colleagues, um, 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 Amit and Dean. So there's the three of us who started that. Yeah. And I'll, I will make sure I tell them what you said also. So No, it is awesome. I'll be honest with you. When I went, when I uh, transferred up to Berkeley, I wanted to do improv because I was doing it so much down here. And I was like, how am I going to do improv? And I, luckily I stumbled upon end games. I didn't even know it existed. I stumbled upon it. And like, but besides that, everything else was just so locked down in terms of like, the barrier of entry or whatever like it was hard to go to other improv places it was almost like a secret society or something well I, uh, back then back then not saying how it is now but back then it was like oh you had to like do your homework to really like figure out where you want to do improv oh yeah i see what you're talking about i thought you meant yeah i, I mean i started learning about all of the different organizations again you know it's, it's on that facebook group but i remember at one point had time on my hands. So I'm like, let me just put these links in this, you know, pin page. And I was surprised, you know, it comes with different um, variations. And it's interesting. Um, you know, sometimes somebody will join and then they'll ask me a question and they don't know me, right? But I guess I'm admin, you, hey, I want to do this. And I can kind of get a flavor of maybe the type of improv that they've either done because they'll share that or um, that they want to do. And, you know, definitely in my opinion, you know, there are certain communities and theaters that have a style, right? Yeah. Um, you know, part of, well, first of all, there's like proximity. So that's usually helpful for people. Um, and then the second one is, you know, if they are looking for certain type of, of improv, you know, I think um, like one of the ones that come to mind that's, that is specific to this style, they're called um, Synergy Theater. They do improvised theater. So, you know, their, their structure is around that uh, kind of story arc, if you will. And they- do, Oh, they do like improv? Of, uh, yeah, I guess kind of like impro. Um, the uh, founder, uh, Ken Adams, I believe, uh, comes from kind of that background. Cool. Uh, he's got Bats background. So they've done like, um, I took my mom to this. Uh, what was it? Was it Spontaneous Sherlock? or something like that. I just remember my mom leaving and she was arguing with me. It was scripted. I'm like, mom, it wasn't scripted. And I'm like, this is the greatest <laughs> comment ever. And it was it was really lovely. And they'll do, they've done like a spontaneous Shakespeare. Um, I had an opportunity at one point to be part of spontaneous sitcom, which was amazing because we did three shows in one night as a reunion of the comedy, you know, like a 90s comedy, uh, you know, and it was, um, you know, it, oh, in the construct of an actual sitcom. So even the timing, you know, you got your opening, you got your seven minutes, you know, just everything was timed that way. So it was a different experience for me to learn that. And then also playing the same character, you know, so you're gifted this, character in the beginning when you go out and ask questions and so to learn that type of improv 
within this structure of a sitcom and doing three, you know, 25 ish minute, you know, shows. There was one that was a break. I mean, that's, that was super different for me. My point being, there might be other um, theaters and, and communities that do that kind. Um, so if there are in San Francisco Bay Area, please let me know. Well, so I, that. <laughs> I feel bad. I'm not trying to pick one over the other. It just comes to mind. That was sort of the the comment I made about, you know, I, I get to start to learn about what different uh, communities and organizations have to offer. I think that's great that you have that Facebook group. Uh, you know, I think, you know, people forget that the Bay Area is one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the country, you know, so there's plenty of opportunities for the arts, especially theater. Um, it's just, I know, I know more, I know now I'm sure it's more connected, but when I first went out there, because I was a complete stranger, just the work of finding where to do improv yeah. was, was hard. Yeah. Then as I stayed there, it seemed like, oh, I found more and more and more. Uh, it's just people were kind of like, well, I do this kind of improv and they do that kind of improv. So maybe we're not going to meet, but maybe people over time, they ended up, you know, easing up their their guards or whatever and ended up coming together, which was nice. You know, and I'm sure that Facebook group helped out, stuff like that, you I know? Hope so. so yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure yeah. it did. Because I remember I met a lot of improv groups. I'm like, oh, you guys are from this place? I never heard of that place. They're like, well, yeah, we never come out of our, like, of our space, but now we feel like we have to, you know? So... It was an interesting time to be there. I will say then that, um, and I know you know this about me, that that group was really, is really special, you know, to find out what's out there. Because I remember when I got on it one time, I was like, wait, there's a group that does this? And it's a group told Untold Improv. So caveat disclaimer, I have since after going through their first, uh, their second cohort, um, you know, volunteer my time with them. And their uh, objective is to bring, um, you know, joy in uncertainty. And they specifically look at um, improv for people of color. So I found out because <laughs> I saw about it on the Facebook group. And I think that was like 2017. But Prior to that, I had already been kind of chewing on this idea <clears throat> while I was at Endgames, <clears throat> excuse me, back in like 2014, 2015. So it's kind of one of those things like, wow, this, to me, that was a, a day where like, okay, this Facebook group is, this is good, you know? And I remember thinking, how did they find us? Because I don't, I also don't know how people find us. It's not like we go out and, you know, but I, you know, I guess it's a keyword search uh, for improv. Well you know, I'll say this as someone who's been part of a few improv communities and, you know, almost trying to do outreach of different improv groups or sketch groups, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, some people just, they don't want to fuck with anybody. And that's a term we say here in, in SoCal. I, I, what that term means is like, they just don't want to work with anybody that they have no interest in and they're okay just working independently in their own sure. uh, specific space, you know? So sometimes that secret group might have the thing you're looking for though and to access them to unlock access is like how do I do that and it's so cool that you set the means for that never intending to to that specific thing but it, it came your way and I know you've done great work with them you know that's interesting why were you chewing on this um POC idea of doing POC improv in the Bay Area back in 2014 <clears throat> I think I think I had already you know started talking a little bit about that earlier. I mean, one thing is like I would get excited if I saw somebody that was Filipino. So, of the three of us that had founded that Facebook group, one of the fellows, Dean, is is Filipino, and you know we could create scenes together, knowing that we could say things with a particular context that we already knew each other would know. And I wouldn't say that that was maybe the first time I thought about it, but I, I'm sure that that was part of what influenced me thinking, oh, this is cool. And I can say that, and, and I started writing about this, you know, there was some point in time where I was talking to one of my other team members 
in a, I'm trying to think now, I think it was scene chicken is what we called ourselves. Um, we're like a Herald team out of end games. And it was a woman, Emily, and I had talked about just the idea of um, bringing a social cultural perspective. So um, I'll just share that I was in a classroom setting at one point where I did a scene where I was, the shlupia tastes so good, you know, that kind of thing. And scene went on and um, during the break, so please don't try to guess where this happened, okay? But I just, just for illustrative purposes. I appreciate um, you sharing, thank you. During, yeah, during the break, um, I was, uh, uh, it was commented that, you know, hey, you know, maybe not everybody knows what lumpia is. So you know, just remember that. And I'm thinking, okay. And also in my head, I'm like, did I not do that right? You know, like that space object thing. I'm like, Ooh, you know, and it, it didn't seem like a big deal. And then I was driving home and it's like a 40 minute ride home. And I'm like, that's weird. Why am I still thinking about what happened? Sort of put that in the back of my mind. And I don't know. I think there was something around that. And also there were times where I might have kind of, you know, shoehorned in some kind of cultural or racial or, you know, very gender specific topic at a jam or something. I can't remember how it was coming up. But at one point, I, re I started writing a Facebook message to friends. And there was a discussion that was happening around diversity in one of the communities. And I was like, hey, what if we did this? So it was just taking what we already do and just kind of shifting it a little bit. You know, what if we played some of the improv games that also layered a cultural context on them or made the games, you know, be about that? You know, I don't, I'm just, this is, you know, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think about like, you know, what that would sound like. I, I have a whole blog post about that. And, you know, maybe it is just from the get go. Um, you know, choosing words that are specific to, you know, a type of holiday or like a quinceanera, you know, and letting that be the uh, jumping off point or um, just starting to use names that are, you know, less Eurocentric, why not? Um, and just little things like that, but then also maybe start to, you know, it doesn't have to be about race. It doesn't have to be about, you know, things or maybe it is who knows what happens out of it and i do remember sending this uh facebook message out to friends going hey why don't we try this and it's sort of built into um you know uh so this is a good ex example uh there's a team i was on the letters and i think you know some of the folks that I are think I do. Yeah, it was on there. A, yeah it's krish krish it was krish avi um uh um uh, rashput uh mike ortiz megan Sauter and um, Matt, uh, they're, they're now married. Um, oh, nice. And um, so we were kind of the original, I guess, of the letters. And, you know, we would get a book from the audience and then we'd do a scene based on reading a short passage or whatever page number. And, you know, how do you take that? Well, what if we picked a book that was written by a woman of color, you know, that perhaps also our stories that, you know, might have a passage that we pick that has some interesting, you know, uh, uh, passage in there, right? And just things like that. And maybe it's not an interesting passage. Maybe it's just the author, you know, just bringing that kind of essence. Um, you know, some of it was the presence of um, more diversity. I and mean, there's a lot of ways to, to think about, you know, if you have more diverse folks, maybe more diverse stories will show up. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, I'll, I'll sort of stop there because there's sort of this other dark side and I know maybe that, maybe we could talk whoa, about that whoa, too. <laughs> whoa, we're here, right? What, what happened with that Facebook message? Well, how was it? How was no, it the oh, it was received. Okay. Um, you know, I, th it didn't quite go anywhere other than more discussion. Um, I sent it out, I think later on, I, oh, I, I had an opportunity to go to like the five week in Chicago and my friend Emily and I were continuing to talk about, you know, how to make those things happen and, you know, different contexts, you know, maybe bringing in music that also has kind of, you know, a specific 
um, themes. What's and, your friend's uh, full name? Emily what? Uh, Emily Say. I don't know her. Sorry. I know they're Emily from Emily. Yeah. Never mind. And um, so, um, so it kind of was more of a discussion point. Um, I would say, you know, there ultimately was um, separate from this whole thing, uh, a diversity jam that actually came out of um, and Endgames actually hosted a diversity jam. They had had an LGBTQ jam as well. Um, so, so that's where sort of that discussion went. Separately, I just started processing this and sort of what when I was in Chicago, I sort of came up with this, oh my gosh, colorized improv. Colorized coming from the a term that I read in a book by a fellow named Jeff Chang. He wrote a book called Who We Be. It was about the um, you know post civil rights era and sort of what's that was a big book and, back when it came out. Yeah, exact big book dense and big book big. Also, I have the I hard meant copy. like uh, like in terms of, of, of its uh, you know its arrival and impact. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. Jeff is a wonderful author. I mean, he's got his. I, I could go on about him. You know. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's authored that uh, book on um, hip hop music, and he's got a set of essays. And I I don't know if he's already got it out yet, like a, a biography of Bruce Lee. Oh wow! Um, yeah. And, nonetheless, um, so yeah, colorized improv, and it was I started thinking of it like a movement. You know, this is so bring putting together the social, cultural, personal, lived experiences. You know, the perspectives and um, narratives. So sort of being more um, deliberate and um, forthright in approaching maybe improv, the creation of characters that embrace, you know, your lived experience. Um, it's not like playback theater. It's just really more like, like something really simple. I mean, I'll do a simple thing and this is unrelated to colorized improv, but I remember in a scene um, we were doing kind of that uh, you know, that where you have two cops at a crime scene, and you're kind of looking at a body and all that. And I believe I called my uh, team member, it was like, you know, Detective Washington or something like that. But the first name was Vivek. Like, I was just like, I'm just, you know, yeah, you know, oh, do you mind if I call you Vivek? You know, like, th like, you know, that's a, that's a pleasant surprise for both of us, right, um, in the scene. And I remember my team member saying, hey, that was pretty cool, which is sort of odd because I don't think I've ever said to anybody, hey, thanks for calling me Susan, you know, <laughs> or thanks for calling me Michelle, you know. Um, so, so nonetheless, with Colorized Improv, I started thinking about it like a movement in that Yes, there's sort of the hallmarks of what you might infuse into your improv performance, um, but also maybe the construct, you know, around it. Um, I don't think we talk enough about how a lot of improv scenes uphold white norms as the basis of all society or something like that. I don't think it's talked enough about ever in any class. No one ever mentions it. I will say this, every time I've done improv with a majority diverse group, it's, I don't say it's funner, but it's different. And there's things that we can talk about that I would never be able to do like in an all white group. And uh, it's more safe, more comfortable. Um, and sometimes I've done that both without the intention. I just happen to be attracted to playing with diverse people. And then there's, there was a point where I had my own shift where I was like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make my, my, my majority of my efforts to work with diverse people. And it's just, it's a different way of, of interacting and playing and uh yeah so I, I don't i don't blame you for being like hey this is different i like it i don't have to be mike or, or john well, or brenda or, or whatever yeah you know? and those are still fine too right um when i say those those names are also still fine and they don't necessarily have to represent who we would normally think but that's sort of what happens right um at times i will say you know i i kind of uh glossed over it not intentionally but you know when i discovered untold improv um Chris and I, you know, so we've been doing improv for a while. And I remember thinking, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to keep buying into this cult and throwing my money at improv. But of course I will, because I'll take workshops and, you know, courses. But we're like, okay, let's go to this untold improv. We can go for free. And if we want to, we can take a class. And, you know, they had a certain amount of uh, capacity. And we went 
uh, everybody there was a person of color. And halfway through during the break, I was realizing I have these other commitments that may not allow me to keep taking this class. And Krish looked at me, he said, this is so different. This is amazing. <laughs> and what was really more amazing, it wasn't like we were doing a bunch of, you know, uh, traditional improv um, exercises and, and um, heralding being, you know, people of color. It was just that we were just there as people of color. There was something where I think there were some inherent shared, you know, experiences in the air that you uh, realize. Anyways, the point being, Chris is like, I'm in. So I'm like, okay, I got, I got to go in. I got to figure out how to make this happen. And I remember, I think to the credit of the founders, um, April and, and Brian, who goes by the nickname Otter, they have a background also in like summer camp, you know, oh. folks. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just this joy and uncertainty, their um, ability, also in diversity and inclusion as well, their ability to bring kind of this, this curriculum with this fun, and weave in some other activities that are also related to maybe to more, you know, diversity and inclusion, equity type of activities, as well as, you know, sort of what you might experience in a kind of social justice um, forum. And I, it's just, it, there's just something really lovely about it. Um, they, they really think and thought about how to, you know, incorporate the improv practices, exercise warmups, and then sort of weave in these other stories and exercises that also still acknowledge and, and honor folks. They, they have a different way of also allowing people, and I say different because there's an opt, opt out. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, oh, and more importantly, they had um, a, a big, uh, you know, piece of paper where they had expectations and agreements. So they had all of that listed. You know, these are things I know that I've experienced in meetings I've gone to where you're looking to make sure you have a shared dialogue, right? Uh, mutual objectives. And so we would go through it. And, you know, at the end, it's like, oh, you know, if you anybody have any questions, does anybody want to add something? And the, um, the, the expectations and the like, I mean, they're just really lovely, which is something I'd, I'd, I'd never seen, like written. So it wasn't this unspoken thing. I'm sitting here trying furiously to see if I can pull up something that even um, shows something about, you know, what uh, a couple of the, um, I don't know if I can find it quickly enough, um, expectations well, are. You know, uh... Uh, I could see how that could be very impactful just being in a space like that just for the majority of people who look like you because you know that's not always the case in improv you know at least when I was up in the Bay Area I was usually the only person of color except to be fair I went through the improv program with uh, this wonderful gay man named Victor I can't remember his last name but he was really cool but him and I were mostly the the only POC in the classes or sometimes in the shows. And I think Victor was better at navigating that than I was because he had lived in San Francisco for a long time. He's also a gay man. So there's that's another identity that he can, you know, navigate the world with. Where for me, I was like, wow, this is all very different. I'm just gonna keep quiet and <laughs> kind of figure it out. Um, but like at some point I got I personally got tired of that. Um, but this isn't in San Francisco. It was till years later on. And that's why now I do majority work with uh, diverse groups, but back in San Francisco, I could see how like, how impactful that would be if, all right, I'm, there's few POC in our theater company and I go to the space and everyone here is POC and the way it's being led is very kind and considerate and getting you to buy in throughout the process. That's That's gotta be very impactful. Yeah, I well, let me do this. So I did find it, I'll, I'll, I'll list some five things, but there's more that they have. Um, um, practice self-care, and this is expectations and agreements in the class, right? Um, give yourself and others permission to be silly and to fail. We celebrate mistakes. What if we shift fear 
to curiosity. And then when in doubt, ask. And wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, you know, there's one that I'm not able to find right now, but if I can before this is over, I will, because they, they're, what I want to say about that, you know, um, just the having of expressed expectations and agreements and in this language that is, you know, pretty much, I think, you know, kind of universal as human beings. I mean, it was just, it was just lovely. Um, one of the memorable moments for me at Untold, we were taking a break and they would do check-ins. And so we're in a circle. And I remember sharing how I was in a space where I knew that more than likely everybody in the space understood what code switch meant. And it was interesting because people were like, oh yeah. And that was it. <laughs> I mean, nobody was going off, you know, I mean, we all got our own stories, right? But I don't know how many places, well, maybe now it's a little bit different, right? Because there has been, um, you know, much more um, overt discussions about issues for, you know, inclusivity, um, languaging, around discussions of race and anti-racism and, you know, equity and representation and belonging. So, but, you know, it, it was just being able to say that it was like, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, code switching is something that a lot of uh, diversity providers have to do, you know, and there's a part of your identity that you have to kind of hide or suppress or, or, or play down if you want to have success in these spaces and success being measured by the connections you make, uh, the opportunities that are extended to you, the things you're invited to, you know, um, that is the, that, that is what you're paying for. That is the thing that you're suppressing your ethnicity for. I know it sounds terrible to say it, but people have done it. People will do it. People are doing it right now. It's just, that's just the price and that's the code switch. It's like, you want access to this space and resources, you got a code switch. And well, because of the majority perspective, yes. And, 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 and prevalence. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. If I left that part out, I didn't mean to. I'm just saying, yeah. if you're going to fit in with a bunch of white people, yeah. so, <laughs> you can't be so brown. You know what well, I mean? Well, <laughs> yeah, and it might be changing, though. I mean, I, you know, so I don't know if it's changing, um, you know, for all the wonderful heartfelt reasons, you know, or if it's checkbox diversity. I don't know. You know, I don't know if it, if it's one of those things like, oh, if we get to this point where there's this you know, greater population of X, Y, Z, um, we're there, you know, punch card, well, you know, let's hope that's not the case. And, and, and I don't think it is. Well, but to but, be fair, there, there are efforts. It's just, I don't know. I, I don't know how to put it. You know, if, if your leadership or if your community isn't a certain like threshold, you know, sometimes a white person may not necessarily empathize with you the way you want them to empathize with you, or they may fetishize you a certain way. Or maybe it's more about, I think sometimes some of these diversity initiatives, it's about making themselves feel good about not being racist when it's kind of like a low key racism doing this kind of handout, which is like, here, I gave you something. Now I can say that I'm not racist. You know, or, like, I, yeah, I don't yeah. your feelings about it, you know? Or, and I, and I saw this, this was a, a recent SNL sketch, right? This last week, or it's, it, it's doing something where they don't feel uncomfortable. You know, kind of thing. Oh, the Aunt Jemima sketch. Yeah, the, the Aunt Jemima sketch. That yes. that that, that was, was a good sketch. That was a good sketch. When they said that, I was like, "Oh, oh, go you!" Um, th for a variety of reasons, even just the first two opening lines were great. I, if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, share the couple more of the expectations please. and agreements. Yes, yes, yes please. please. Um, uh, let's see. Challenge by choice. Opt in or opt out. There's a difference between discomfort and pain. Respect personal boundaries, space, touch, and topics. Uh, choose real over funny. I like that. That's good. Yeah. And um, what is learned here leaves here. What is said here stays here. So that's the joy 
And wow, that's right. they're geniuses, huh? Yeah. They should... Well, uh, hang on to your seats. All right. Be aware of your power and privilege. I like that one. Yeah. That's a good one, you know. And it's it's really interesting. So, you know, I'm not going to do this justice perhaps, but Brian, you know, one of the co-founders, um, he presents, you know, light skin. He's half Asian, half white. And he realizes he's the instructor. And he's very clear about letting people know that, you know, he's there for us. Like, I remember listening to him say this and I just thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to probably end up taking this class. What is happening? You know, what's, gonna, what's happening here? And, you know, there was something about that to, to make that acknowledgement. And actually just to key off of, jump off of that word, you know, we were in the um, Tenderloin area. So there was also a land acknowledgement statement that was made when, you know, before this we started when? class. Was that? When was this? 2017. When Untold Improv started when we were That's in the class. That's awesome. Yeah. Like yeah. I was like, oh, we did a, you know, kind of a visualization generations exercise as well in one of the classes, you know, going back, you know, to your ancestors to kind of think about, you know, I, it's just, it's just very, it's very moving and, and healing. I mean, there's some of what they, they've done and it's literally, we're doing they have a game called this is so fun i can't do it now i guess but it's you know maybe what maybe what i'll do is uh see if i can get them to give a video is, and then uh, we can put it in there is untold improv are they doing any classes online right now you know uh, not right now um they've been you know i might get them on the podcast both uh, otter and april who you introduced me to yes uh, last year when i went to go teach a class uh, for untold improv. Sketch Thank you so much for that. Writing, yeah, sketch writing class. Thank you for that. And I continue to write, by the way. No, that's great. I I'm do. so happy. I'm so happy to hear that. That was a good uh that was a good cohort. I really like that group. Yeah, I wanted to let you know. Remember I handed out little notebooks to people? Yes. I still have my notebook. I oh my god, that's my, so awesome. Yeah, I've got my notebook of uh of different things. Yeah, I um I used yes. those notebooks to uh to map out a show we did in February actually. It was called the Marlando show and I used it to ideate and it was really fun. I filled it up. So thank you so much for that. Oh yeah, you're welcome. You should let me know if you want more. I'm I'm quite the journal person. <laughs> Bullet <laughs> journal, paper journal. Um well, yeah, so there you go. I mean, I think it's, I mean, I met uh, Otter and April and the other gentleman, he was a member, I can't remember his name right now. A really funny stand-up. Um, uh, uh, Jordan? Jordan, yes. And, um, you know, they're really into what I was teaching, but they're also uh, giving me feedback, you know, giving me questions. It was a very good group because it wasn't like me, just me lecturing. It was a, it was a conversation, you know, yes. and I'm sure that them being teachers themselves, they're aware of like the student has to do their part as well. You know? I I have I can't believe I didn't let you know, but I found out the day of also, um, or or maybe the day before, um, April was doing stand up. Oh, that's <laughs> so awesome! Awesome, yeah. So I missed her show, so I need to uh, go back in and double check. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's super awesome, and and I um. You know, I have to admit, I haven't checked about um, classes. I know I talked to Otter a while back. He and I at one point did kind of a improv, you know, uh, character kind of study together. We were, I don't know, now that I'm saying this, I'll, I'll have to make sure to also add that to my list um, to well, see what we can get you. Well, Untold Improv, if you're listening, please do classes. We need your work in the world because you've impacted uh, Shirley Rivera and I'm sure she's not an easy person to impact. Just... <laughs> um, and from all the agreements that you posted out, I've never had an improv class have those agreements put that way. And, you know, I think it's amazing. Also like, you know, I've been to a lot of improv classes or like improv drop-ins where there'll be POC that come in. And like, I feel like sometimes half stay and half go. You know, but I feel if there's like a POC oh. teacher, they're more likely to stay. You know what I mean? Uh, like they might be more open to it. When, when I was in college, I was a political science major and a history major. Uh, don't do either now, but the things I learned <laughs> apply in how, how I leadership, how I do, I do leadership now. And I think that I, 
and an idea that always resonated with me was the idea of uh, virtual representation. How, uh, if there was like a African American congressman, they would in a way represent all African Americans. Not that they were trying to do that. It's just if African Americans see one of themselves or Latinx, whatever, they feel they can go to that person for their questions. They can go to that person for their concerns. That sure. Them, yeah. Through them, they feel that their voice has like has ha uh, has a say. And I think that also reflects in the leadership of theaters and communities, which also includes teachers and coaches and stuff like that. You so know, it's, cool. it's cool that Untold Improv has that. Yes, it is. And and I mean, I, I'll, I'll kind of go back to something that's maybe, that's actually not specific to POC, but I remember very much so, you know, just starting to see uh, women instructors at end games and then the, you know, uh, female all you know troop of uh, vagina jones they were hosting like these all women i remember that group. They were funny. oh super funny and you know it, it was one of those you're right and then you see that it's like oh yeah w i can do this too with folks that you know i mean that kind of thing um yeah so thank you for not letting me go down to the little dark part we, we can do that off <laughs> Oh, and I, I can mean, tell you a little story later. I don't, I don't, I don't try to force you to go anywhere you don't want to go. Yeah, if yeah. you want to share it, uh, no, it's fine. Yeah. But like, if you don't, there's I'll no just, pressure either. I'll just say that you know, I hope that as people talk about the improv scene, that in San, in the San Francisco Bay Area, so the nine counties, that there is an awareness of the. Um, of Untold Improv, you know, that was founded uh, with a specific intentions, a nonprofit. Um, and you know, it's really nice also to see that the uh, more uh, mainstream theaters also have courses, either workshops or courses that are for BIPOC. So I think it's kind of one of those things I remember going, oh, again, that's another thing like, oh, I found this on this Facebook page. Oh, this is also happening at this theater and this theater. So that's sort of neat to see. I think it just, you know, I remember going, hey, don't feel bad that that's happening. Feel good, obviously, right? Um, but I also hope that, you know, maybe there's a little part of it that was inspired by um, Untold Improv. Hopefully folks know about oh. them. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it'd be really um, interesting to see where um, the Bay Area goes and, and other places as well. No, I mean, I think that's awesome. All the work you've done. The Bay Area is a great place to go do improv. If, if you can afford it, it is a pricey place. Uh, but if you're able to navigate um, just all those different spaces and pathways and physically navigate, learn how to use BART and all the buses, <laughs> Uh, I think it's a great place to go, you know, learn a new way of doing improv and connecting with a different group of people. I think it's an amazing area for just kind of the artistic awakening or artistic enlightenment, you know, so it's cool that you've had that experience there. Yeah, and if, if you don't mind, um, I, you know, I know that I've seen you do some summaries of the show here. I will uh, kind of curate this information that I've talked about that's related to, you know, kind of colorized improv and just sort of my experience in, you know, that we've talked about. I'll, I'll pull something together because this is, you've always been a really great supporter of my writing and my your writing's good, expressing. So thank you for that. No, yeah. your writing is very good. I remember your first piece about that one gentleman you oh, dated. You're kind. <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, I, I mean, I, the guy you dated who didn't think you were American, yeah. even though you were born here, you're American as anybody else. And your other work where you really dive deep into the details of, uh, of colorized improv, you know, and everyone should really go check it out. I think, I think it's, uh, it, it merits more attention, especially for the times we're living in. Yeah. And more groups trying to do work that's, you know, like autonomous, you know, it, it doesn't have to be doesn't have the consent of a big theater, you know. They're well, doing yes. So let me let me obviously I'm interrupting. So because I want to go back to circle back to what you said. Then you know you had talked about these other spaces where, you know, we show up as people of color and there's this kind of expectation in kind of the predominant, you know, white space. So you know, and I and I know at the same time, you know, there's also this encouragement that you just gave about like let's go out and do our thing, and. 
you know, obviously, right? I mean, it goes for anything else too. You know, if somebody wants to create an improv team to do a certain kind of thing that's maybe a bit off kilter from the traditional rules or whatever, you know, people will find folks that they can coalesce with and align with. Um, I, I, let's do this. Let's make a little small pact and, you know, in a year, let's see where things are at. And I will make a point to, uh, you know, maybe not super empirical scientific data gathering, but, you know, start to keep a little bit of um, uh, an awareness and, you know, of the pulse of what's happening, at least in the Bay Area. And then I'll check in with you as well. You should. That'd yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's see where things are at. And and I know I've seen stuff written in the conventional, you know, different improv blogs and stuff. Um, I want to make one small plug that's not improv. No, please I, know I, I know I shared this with you, but it is related to something that we're talking about uh, was that sketch that I had written uh, about oh my God, ultimately yes. was about tokenism. Uh, so I know we had a long <laughs> email exchange about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was my first uh, uh, original comedy song effort in a my very first but that was amazing class. yeah that was amazing so, what you did yes I loved it it was super amazing so I'll remember to get that to you as well but I think that's the whole point right we don't want to hopefully if we're in this space we're not just part of uh, tokenism or checkbox diversity you know I, I guess you know I like that that you're fighting against that you know because um I think it takes a certain level of uh, of awareness to arrive to that point but awareness doesn't always equal courage to challenge it oh. but it, it is it is the prerequisite though no because well, you could be aware of it but you know to challenge it, it it's a, it's it takes courage you know because you might feel i don't want to rock the boat or i don't want my classmates to not like me yeah. <laughs> I don't want to stop the professor there's all these concerns correct but to be fair sure. though once you're aware you can't become unaware you know so like it's cool that you that you are challenging all these norms in your way that's best for you. Yeah, in my know? way, and I and, and I'd say thank you to a lot of my other friends who are also doing it in their way, as well as allies. You know, it's it's interesting where I've come across friends who, um, actually they also right allies um, feel that they also might have to gingerly approach the topic. You know, I I don't know how it is now. I have not been involved in the Zoom prov, improv setting since shelter in place. So, you know, perhaps it's, um, well, I don't know. I mean, this is, I, I've given myself a couple of little homework items and apparently we're gonna have an anniversary on the yeah, 12th or somewhere it. around there about the it's, state, it's, it's, state of diversity in improv. Well, it's been about a year since we had a, a real a big talk. So at least once a year, we have to have a, a real, a real big talk. Yes. Thank um, you. Yeah. So I'm down for that. Uh, well, I think, I think that wraps it up then. Uh, is there anything else you want to mention, Shirley? Um, let's see. I, nothing comes to mind. Um, but, but I will admit to those who are watching this. Yes. Beforehand, I actually pulled up what was an improv resume where <laughs> oh, yes, that was yes. pulled together for a specific reason, not because I just wanted to come up with one. Um, and it was interesting to see my journey, you know, in that. Uh, so yes, I'm glad I didn't end up talking from that and we just got to basically chat. So I appreciate this, Fernando, and I appreciate everything you're doing, your poetry. I don't know when you sleep. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and I don't know when your fingers stop typing. So power to you, man. Thank Seriously. you very much. Thank You're, you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Yes, keep doing your work. Keep challenging the system in the way that you are. I want to thank everyone uh, for tuning into this episode. Uh, this has been episode eight of Fernando's Improv Blog Podcast. Thank you again, Shirley Rivera. Follow her on all the social channels. I'm Fernando, and this has been great. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.